So um, sorry about yesterday. Um, I couldn't do a live lecture. So you were supposed to watch two like quick videos that were like the intro to Power Series. Um, so if you haven't done that, make sure you do tonight. We're going to start working on the problem type where we'll at least be able to do the problems if you haven't watched those videos, but it'll make a lot more sense after you've watched those two um, as far as what we're doing. So I want to look at a few problems today where it's just find the center and the interval and radius of convergence. So these will be the directions for the problems we're going to do today. Um, and so let's start with an example and uh, let's use this example that I had. Um, so I want to start with this example. We're going to go the sum k equals one to infinity of negative one to the k over <clears throat> the fifth root of k and then x minus six to the k. So, all right, so I want to talk about that. Oops, sorry, guys, give me one second. Sorry, something fell over. Okay, so I want to talk about that for just a minute. Um, so from yesterday's video, can someone tell me what the center of this power ser series is? You can unmute yourself or put it in chat either way. Six. Yeah, so the center here is six. Um, the center is the X value that makes this zero. So a power series is a series and uh, powers of X or powers of X minus six or X plus two or something like that. And so the center is whatever makes that zero. If you were to plug in six for X, it would make all the terms zero. We know that the power series converges at the X value that corresponds to the center. So the center is important for a couple of reasons, but that's one of them. Um, and then I started talking about, I think the interval and radius of convergence in those videos. And that's basically the domain. So when you're talking about the interval of convergence, that is all of the X values for which this series converges. The center is always part of that inter interval because when you plug in whatever the center is, it makes all of the terms zero. That means the series is going to converge when X is six. But the idea is we wanna find all of the X's that would make it converge. So like if it would, if we plugged in eight, would it then converge? Or if we plugged in five, would it converge? Or if we plugged in a hundred, would it converge? And so the way we typically test for that is we use the ratio test. So almost always we're gonna use the ratio test. Every now and then we may use the root test the times we would use the root test is if everything is to the K and in particular, if it's K to the K. So if this is like K to the K down here, we'd probably use the root test, but al almost without exception, we use the ratio test. So we're going to start with the ratio test and we're going to do the limit as K goes to infinity of the absolute value of AK plus one divided by AK. Well, that's the limit as K approaches infinity of the absolute value. So, okay, so AK plus one is you plug in K plus one for all the Ks. So we're gonna get negative one to the K plus one on top. We're also gonna go ahead and get X minus six to the K plus one on top. And we're gonna get the fifth root of K plus one on the bottom. And then rather than divide by AK, it's times the reciprocal of AK. So we're gonna flip this over and we're gonna put the fifth root of K in the numerator of the fraction and negative one to the K times X minus six to the K in the denominator. Any questions on how I'm getting to there? It's pretty good to there. Okay. And so now we're gonna try to get stuff to cancel out. So we're gonna split up the exponentials. And so we're gonna make it negative one to the K times negative one to the first. And then x minus six to the k times x minus six to the first over the fifth root of k plus one. 
and now times the fifth root of k over negative one to the k times x minus six to the k. And so you can't get the radicals to cancel out, but you can get the exponentials to cancel out. So negative one to the k will cancel, x minus six to the k will cancel, and that's it as far as the canceling. And now we've got to figure out some stuff from here. Any questions to that point is good. Okay, so when we're doing this, what we now do is we try to figure out what can we take the absolute value of, meaning can we figure out the absolute value and take that out of the absolute value sign? And then what can we take out of the limit? So like if we look at negative one, obviously the absolute value of negative one is positive one. So it's just one and one times anything is itself. So this is actually just gonna drop. The X minus six, K is what's approaching infinity, not X. So X minus six could be positive or negative, which means we don't know what the absolute value of that is. So X minus six has to stay in the absolute value but you can pull it out of the limit. And the reason you can do that is because X minus six does not change as K approaches infinity. So we're gonna pull the absolute value of X minus six out of the limit. And then inside the limit, we're still gonna have the fifth root of K. So that obviously does change as K approaches infinity but we know that that's positive. So we can drop the absolute value from that. We know that's positive as K approaches infinity. So the fifth root of K, and then the same argument for the bottom, the fifth root of K plus one, that has to stay in the limit, but it does not have to come out of the absolute value, or I'm sorry, it does not have to stay in the absolute value. So you leave it in the limit, but we know that it's positive. So the absolute value can drop. So we simplify this step to become this, remember negative one drops off because the absolute value of negative one is positive one. All right, any questions so far is good. Uh, so X minus six is fixed as far as K approaches infinity. Somebody in chat says, why doesn't X minus six change? So as K gets bigger, so if K goes from a million to a billion to something larger than that, whatever X is, is still that same value of X. Okay, so X is a variable. We're trying to figure out what uh, X is make this converge, but it doesn't. It's not affected as K goes infinity. All right, other questions so far? Okay, and so then what's this limit part? So what is the limit of the fifth root of K over the fifth root of K plus one? What do you guys think? So if this was on the test last week, you take the biggest thing over the biggest thing. So you get the fifth root of K over the fifth root of K, which is one. So then this is absolute value of X minus six times one, which is then just the absolute value of X minus six. Okay, so what this tells you is that, and so what I'm gonna write in green is not uh, part of this answer, but like, let's say X is nine. Okay, so if X is nine, this is the sum negative one to the K over the fifth root of K times three to the K because it's nine minus six to the K. And so we have the separate series. And this is one where we would use, if we wanted to figure out whether that converges, we would use the ratio test. We would get it down to here and we would actually get nine minus six. So we would get three from this. If you get three out of the ratio test, what does that tell you about the series? So if you get three from the ratio test, what does that tell you about the series? Does it converge or diverge? You guys remember? Diverge? Yeah, it diverges. So the ratio test says that whatever this limit is, if this limit is bigger than one, it diverges. If it's less than one, it converges. And if it's equal to one, then we should not have used the ratio test. So in, for X equals nine, this is going to diverge. If X was, let's say uh, 6.3, then okay, we'd have the negative, some negative one to the K over the fifth root of K times 0 0.3 to the K. 
we would work out the ratio test that would get us 0.3 here because that's less than one, this one would converge. It, it, what I was talking about in the video yesterday is the problem we're doing now is we're trying to basically find the domain. So we're trying to figure out all of the X's that make this converge. So like X equals 6.3, means this does converge. X equals nine would make this diverge. We're trying to figure out all the ones that make it converge. So if this is less than one, we know that it converges. So what we're gonna do is rather than pick random values like this, we're gonna try to determine all of the places where this is less than one because that's what makes it converge. So we work the ratio test out, we get this answer and now we try to determine all of the x's where this expression is less than one. Well, if the absolute value of something is less than one, that means that whatever's inside the absolute value is less than positive one, but it's also bigger than negative one. Because if x minus six was like negative five, negative five, the absolute value of that is five, and that would not be less than one. So all of the values between negative one and positive one work, x minus six is what has to be between those. So to solve for x, we add three, to, or I'm sorry, we add six to all three parts of this inequality. So we get negative one plus six is five, is less than x, and then one plus six is seven. So all of the values between five and seven will make this series converge. That tells us that, okay, when X is 6.3, this does converge because the ratio test would get us an answer that's less than one. We're, we're not done, unfortunately, but does everybody follow it to here? Any questions to here? Okay, and so what this does tell us is that any value between five and seven for X would make the series converge any value outside of that, so less than five or bigger than seven, like nine, would make the series diverge. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if X is five or if X is seven, then the ratio test gets you one. So like if I put five in here, five minus six is negative one, the absolute value that's one. If I put seven in here, seven minus six is one, the absolute value that's one. In those two cases, the ratio test is inconclusive. So we know that it diverges for less than five, that it diverges for bigger than seven. We know that it converges, actually we'll draw this on a number line. So we know that here at five and seven, and here's the center six, we know that it converges inside of here. It diverges over here and it diverges over here but we don't know about five and we don't know about seven because the ratio test is inconclusive when you get one as the answer or the limit on the ratio test. So now what we need to do is we need to independently test X equals five and X equals seven. So we're gonna zoom out just for a minute. And so if I plug in X equals five, then I plug five in for X. And so I get the sum negative one to the K over the fifth root of K times five minus six to the K. And then when I plug in seven, whoops, there's a K there. If I plug in seven, I get negative one to the K over the fifth root of K and then seven minus six to the K. Okay, well, if I do five minus six to the K, that's negative one. So I get negative one to the two K but what's weird about negative one to the two K? So like negative one to the K on this first version makes this alternate why is this not actually alternating? What's because two times anything will give an even number. Yeah, two times any integer k is going to give you an even number. So negative one to any even number is positive one, which means this simplifies further 
to just one over, and we'll go ahead and write it as k to the one fifth. This diverges because it's a p series where p is one fifth, which is less than one. Okay, but the negative one to the 2k simplifies to positive one because 2k is always even. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, now over here, seven minus six is just one. But one to the k is one. So in this case, this remains alternating. This is one where if you take the absolute value, it's one over k to the one fifth, which diverges because it's a p series where p is less than one. But then this series itself converges conditionally by the alternating series test because one over k to the one fifth is positive. It's decreasing and it approaches zero. So then this series converges. Okay, so let's back up and figure out what we have done so far. Any questions on what we've done so far on this problem? There's a lot going on, but can we follow what's going on? Okay, so then what we are trying to figure out, so we figured out the center. We're trying to figure out the interval of convergence and the radius of convergence. The interval of convergence is all of the values that make it converge. Well, back up here, we know that all the values between five and seven make it converge. Down here, we figured out that seven makes it converge, but five makes it diverge. So if I were to indicate that on the number line, I would put a parenthesis or an open circle on five, and I would put a bracket or a closed dot on seven. That means the interval of convergence is from five to seven with a parenthesis on five, meaning we do not include five and a bracket on seven, meaning we do include seven. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, the radius of convergence is the radius of this interval. It's the distance from the center to either endpoint. So the center is six. How far is it from six to either endpoint? So from six to seven or from six to five, what is that distance? So how far is it from six to seven? One. One, and so the radius of convergence here is one. All right, so those are the three answers that this question asked for. So we asked for the center, the interval of convergence and the radius of convergence. Questions on any of that process? We're all good. How did I get the radius? So, okay, so I would look at the graph for that or I would at least think about this graph. So this is just a number line. It's the list of all the X's that make it converge. The center is six. And so the radius is the distance from the center to either endpoint. So the interval is equally spaced around this. It's from six back to five, which is one, and from six up to seven, which is also one. That's the radius of the interval, the distance from the center to the endpoints. Does that make sense? Okay, other questions? I'm sorry, why did the one on the right converge again? Why did it converge? Because down here when X is seven, it's an alternating version of the series. So it's the ones where, like on the test last week, you would take the absolute value, the absolute value diverges, but the original series converges conditionally by the alternating series test. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so like at this stage, you don't need to spell out these proofs, but you need to know whether it converges or diverges. So like you need to do enough so you know the answer. Does that make sense? Like as far as the answer, whether it converges or diverges, that's what the answer would have been on the test last week. All right, other questions so far? Um, what so you... for oh. these questions, it doesn't, you don't make a distinction between converge conditionally and converge absolutely? You don't need to. So what you're trying to figure out is whether this X value makes the series converge or not. 
So like back up here in green, we're saying, okay, well, at X equals nine, this series will diverge. At X equals 6.3, this series will converge. We don't care whether it's absolute value does or not. We just care whether it does. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then somebody else was asking one. Go ahead, whoever that was. Oh, no, you're good. I figured oh. it out. Okay, cool. Other questions so far, you guys? Okay, so we're going to do about probably one or two more examples of this today. But, and I, man, I should have watched that last video. I watched the first video, but not the second video. So I, I think I talked a little bit about this yesterday, but not completely. Um, the point of a power series is to represent functions, or at least in math, the point of a power series is to represent functions. The point of the power series is not to do this type of problem. Just like when you talk about functions in calculus and in algebra, like if I talk about a random function like f of x equals one over x plus seven or something like that. So there's lots of important things about that function. It might be important that it's decreasing or it might be important that there's an asymptote at negative seven. It might be important there's a horizontal asymptote at zero. Uh, it might be important what f of three is. It might be important that there is no maximum. There's lots of different things that are important about this function. One of the important things about the function is its domain but that's not the point of the function. Does everybody get what I mean? So like we know the domain of this function is negative infinity to negative seven, union negative seven to infinity. So everything except negative seven, that is a, an important characteristic of the function, but that's not the point of the function. Does that make sense? You guys see what I'm saying? So like it's important to know that X can't be negative seven, but that's not the only thing that's important about that function. Well, for power series, it, this is like the domain. It's important to know, like up here, the domain's everything except negative seven. Well, here the domain is everything from five to seven, not including five and including seven. That is an important thing about a power series, but that's not the point of the power series. It's just the domain on a power series takes a lot more work than it does to figure out the domain of something like this. So. It just happens to be the first like standard problem we do for power series, but it's important to know that this isn't like the reason we do power series. It's just the first main thing we figure out other than what we were talking about yesterday, which is just kind of the idea behind power series. That stuff's actually probably more important than what we're doing today. We spend time on this because it takes a good bit of work to get the domain. But remember, this is kind of a side thing. This is not the reason we study power series. I do want us to get good at this and it is important, but just remember that like, if you look at this power series, it's not like the answer to the power series is this. This is, these are just some characteristics of the power series. The center is something important about it. The interval of convergence is basically the domain. That's something important about it. The radius of convergence has to do with the domain and it has to do with a theorem that we won't prove in here, but that whatever the center of the power series is, the domain or the interval of convergence always has to be equally spaced around that. So the radius means that, hey, it's from five to seven. That means because it's equally spaced around six, we can talk about a radius, just the distance from the center to the end point. The advantage of talking about the radius is that we could have figured out the radius back here. So when I got to five to seven, we knew that it goes from five to seven. That means we know the radius is one, that it goes from six to seven or six back to five. And we could have figured out the radius without doing this extra work of determining whether the endpoints are included. So later when we're doing more complicated problems, a lot of times we'll say, hey, let's just figure out the radius of convergence and let's not bother to figure out whether the endpoints are included. So the reason that it's useful to talk about radius is because it makes stuff later easier because this is a lot of work to determine whether to put a bracket or a parenthesis on the number. And a lot of times that's not super relevant. We may not need to know that if you want to know the interval of convergence, you do need to know that. But a lot of times it's not important whether those two endpoints are included. And so we can kind of get around that by talking about the radius rather than the interval later. All right, a lot of stuff. Please ask if there are questions. That's
everybody clear on what we're talking about so far? Okay, so we need to be able to find, we need to be able to figure out center, that, that's easy. We need to be able to figure out the interval and radius convergence. And so we're gonna do another one, but basically what we do each time is we do the interval test almost with, or I'm sorry, we do the ratio test almost without exception. And then if there are endpoints, which a lot of times there are, then you independently test the endpoints to determine whether to put parentheses or brackets on those. All right, so let's do a second example, but last questions, last answer questions on this one. We're good? All right, so we're gonna go through and do, let me get a good one to do. Let's do, uh, I want one, yeah, let's do this one. All right, so number two, so same directions, find the center, interval, and radius of convergence. The center, and then the interval of convergence and the radius of convergence. For the sum, k equals one to infinity of four to the k, k squared x plus seven to the k. All right, so let's look at this one. Okay, so before doing anything, what can we figure out? Can we figure out the center? So we'll make an answer blank. So we've got center, the interval of convergence, and radius of convergence. Which of those can we do just by looking at the series? The center is, the center. is negative seven. And the center is negative seven. So the center is what makes this part zero. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so center is negative seven. Now, that, that means if we want to go ahead and draw a number line, the interval of convergence is going to be equally spaced around that. And so we try to figure out what that is by doing the ratio test. So here we're doing the limit as k goes to infinity of the absolute value of ak plus one over ak. This time, since the thing isn't a fraction or it doesn't have a denominator, other than one, you just plug in k plus one and we'll do four to the k plus one, k plus one squared, whoops, not to the k, k plus one squared, and then x plus seven to the k plus one. And then we'll just go ahead and put it over a k, which is four to the k, k squared and x plus seven to the k. So normally we do times the reciprocal, but here we've just got, uh, one line, so we do it that way, or we can do it that way. All right, so we're gonna break up the exponentials and make it four to the K times four to the first times K plus one squared. We're gonna leave that alone. And then X plus seven to the K and X plus seven to the first. And then we've got four to the K, K squared and X plus seven on the bottom, X plus seven to the K on the bottom. All right, so that lets us cancel the four to the Ks and it lets us cancel the X plus seven to the Ks. All right. And so now we're gonna pull out constants as far as k goes, so things that don't change as k approaches infinity, and we're going to leave in uh, stuff that does change as k goes to infinity. So the 4 can come out. We know that 4 is positive, so it can come out of the absolute value. 4 does not change as k gets bigger, so we can also pull that out of the limit. This will stay in the limit. The k squared on the bottom will stay in the limit, but x plus 7 can come out of the limit but it's the absolute value of X plus seven that comes out of the limit. Uh, and that's because X can be positive or negative, even though K is approaching infinity. So K has to be positive, but X does not. All right, and then inside the limit, we still have K plus one squared. We do know that's positive, so we can take it out of the absolute value, but you cannot take that out of the limit. Same for K squared, K squared is positive, but uh, so it can come out of the absolute value. 
but it does change as k goes to infinity so you leave it inside of the limit any questions on the algebra and the limit stuff to here that's good okay so the limit of this part the biggest thing on top is k squared biggest thing on bottom is k squared so this part is one so we get four times the absolute value of x plus seven times one. That then simplifies to four times the absolute value of x plus seven. Okay, so then what we do from here is we, that's what we're gonna get out of the ratio test. So we wanna know when is this less than one? So we try to solve this absolute value inequality. The way we do that is we want to get the absolute value by itself. So we're going to divide by four. And then if the absolute value is less than a positive number, that means that it's got to be x plus seven has to be less than one fourth but also bigger than negative one fourth. Okay, so it's gotta be between negative one fourth and positive one fourth. Now we subtract seven from all three parts, but we wanna think of seven as being 28 over four. So we're gonna go negative 29 over four is less than X, is less than negative 27 over four. So common denominators, seven becomes 28 fourths. We subtract 28 fourths from all those. So negative one fourth minus 28 fourths is negative 29 fourths. And one fourth minus 28 fourths is negative 27 fourths. All right, any questions to there? I thought that when you divided with an inequality, you had to flip the signs. You have to do that if you divide by a negative sign, by a negative number, but not by a positive number. Okay. okay thank that's you. Great. Yeah. Lots of, it's been a long time since a lot of us have done any of this algebra. So, any other questions like that, feel free to ask. All right. Any other questions so far? Okay. So, then if I look at the number line, we're going to go, ahead, I'm going to go ahead and put these on there. So, negative sevens here. Well, negative 29 fourths is negative seven and one fourth. So it's a little to the left of negative seven. So we're gonna put it here. And then negative 27 fourths is negative six and three fourths. So we're gonna put that here. And keep in mind, this is negative 28 fourths. So actually we can answer part of this already. Do we know the interval? Do we know the radius? Or do we know both of those at this point? Somebody's telling me in chat, but it hid. Yeah, the radius is one fourth because the distance from the center to either end point is one fourth. So we know the radius of convergence is one fourth. And we know where the interval starts and stops. The only thing we don't know is whether to put parentheses or brackets on those. And so that's one of the big advantages of talking about the radius of convergence because later, if we've done a big problem, and we're trying to figure out, okay, this is our power series. And then we need to figure out where does it converge. We may only care about the radius. And so it's quicker to find the radius. If we want to find the interval, now we have to independently test these two. The reason we have to do that is because at those values, the ratio test would have given us one. And so if the ratio test gives us one, then the ratio test is inconclusive. And so we don't know whether it converges at the two endpoints. What we do know is that it converges between the endpoints and it diverges outside of that interval, but we don't know whether to include these. So now we go through and we test the endpoints. So we're gonna zoom out a little bit so we can see everything, but we've got X equals 20, negative 29 over four and x equals negative 27 over four as endpoints. And so we're gonna plug that into the original series. We're gonna plug each of those into the original series. So we get the sum uh, four to the k, k squared times negative 29 over four plus seven 
to the K, and then the sum four to the K, K squared times negative 27 over four plus seven to the K. All right, is everybody clear where I'm getting that? So I'm plugging these X values into the original series that we got and I'm replacing X with those. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom back in so I can write a little bit easier. All right, so now we're gonna simplify these. So remember that seven is 28 fourths. So negative 29 fourths plus 28 fourths is negative one fourth. We're then gonna split that into negative one to the K over four to the K. It's important to do that because now the four to the K's cancel and we get negative one to the K times K squared. And we'll talk about what that does in just a second. But we're gonna do a similar simplification over here. Seven again is 28 fourths. So negative 27 fourths plus 28 fourths is positive one fourth. You can simplify that to become one to the K, which is one over four to the K. The four to the K's cancel and we get just K squared because one to the K is one. Any questions on the simplification on those? Okay, so what does the series on the left do and why? Does that converge or diverge or do we not know how to do that one? So it diverges by the K term test because the limit as K goes to infinity of the sequence is not zero. K squared goes to infinity. So the limit of the sequence is not zero. So this diverges by the K term test and actually so does the other one. So the limit of K squared is infinity. So this diverges by K term test in both cases. But you know, if this had been negative one to the K over K squared, then okay, this would converge. If this was one over K squared, it would converge. So it just depends. But in this case, they both diverge. That means you put parentheses on both of the endpoints. And so the interval of convergence is like this. And so it goes from negative 29 over four to negative 27 over four. And we do not include either endpoint because it diverges at both of those values. All right, so the answer to the questions that we were asked, which were find the center of the power series and then find the interval and radius of convergence of the power series, those are the answers to those questions. Interval radius convergence, basically the domain center is something unique. Well, not unique, but it's something that isn't something we normally think of the functions having, but power series do have a center. All right, any questions on this? Everybody good so far? Okay. All right, so I want to get to another example. So again, center interval and radius of convergence. So number three is going to be the sum k equals one to infinity of, uh, we'll do, let's do actually 2x minus one to the k over, uh, we'll do 3k factorial. All right, so let's try that. All right, so again, the question is going to ask right now, the question is going to ask for the center. Or what I'm asking is center interval of convergence and radius of convergence. Okay, and we got to be careful, but the center here is actually uh, one half uh, because the center is whatever makes this zero. So uh, one does not, because if you plug in one, you get two times one minus one, which is one. We want it to be zero, two times a half minus one is zero. Um, that also means that 
on these problems, we don't need to do this, but later we're gonna wanna get in the habit of rewriting it this way. And we're gonna go ahead and do it here. Like I said, we don't need to do this for the problem we're asked, but do we see how this can happen? So the algebra that I'm doing there is that 2x minus one to the k is the same thing as two times x minus a half all to the k. And then I can raise each part of that to the k. So those are equal to each other. You're, when we're doing power series, as we continue to do power series, you're always going to want the x within the uh, power of k or whatever this is, k or 2k or whatever. You're going to want the coefficient of x to be 1. And so if the coefficient of x is something else, you want to get in the habit of factoring that out and, and uh, putting it outside like that. And so uh, it's easier to look at that and know that the center is one half for one thing, uh, but it's also important for some stuff we're going to do later. All right, any questions to there? And, and like I said, on this problem, we wouldn't have to do this, but we're going to go ahead and do it just to get in that habit. Okay, so the center is one half. To find the interval and radius of convergence, we're going to then do the ratio test. Oops. All right, so we're going to take the limit as k goes to infinity of the absolute value of a k plus 1. Well, a k plus 1 is 2 to the k plus 1, x minus 1 half to the k plus 1, and then 3k plus 3 factorial on the bottom. And then times the reciprocal 3k factorial over 2 to the k x minus 1 half to the k. Now we're going to split up the exponentials. So we get 2 to the k times 2 to the first x minus 1 half to the k times x minus 1 half to the first. And then we're going to split the factorial into 3k plus 3, 3k plus 2, 3k plus 1, and then stop with 3k factorial to get it to cancel with the other one. All right, so a lot of algebra, but algebra we're hopefully starting to get used to, or we will as we're doing uh, these problems. Any questions to there? All right. And so we're going to cancel out a bunch of stuff. So the 2 to the k's cancel, the 3k factorials cancel, and the x minus 1 half to the k's cancel. Oh, my bad. And now we're going to want to take some stuff out of the limit. So the two can come out. The absolute value of x minus one half can come out. And then inside we have one over three k plus three, three k plus two, three k plus one. that limit part is zero because the top goes to one. Obviously the bottom, the biggest thing is 27 K to the third. Well, that goes to zero. And so we, or I'm sorry, that bottom goes to infinity. So we get one over infinity, which is zero. And then what is it when you do two absolute value of X minus one half and then multiply by zero, what does that simplify to? It would just simplify to zero. Yeah, it just simplifies to zero. And so what that tells you is that, first of all, luckily, this one's a lot easier than the other two problems, but it's also a lot easier to get backwards. So we have to think about what's happening. So this tells you that no matter what x is, when you do the ratio test, you get zero as the limit. What does that mean the series does? So for any x, you get 0 as the limit on the ratio test. What does that tell you about the series? Doesn't that mean it converges? It means it converges. So it converges for every x. Does that make sense to everybody? 
converges for every x. Well, that means the interval of convergence is negative infinity to infinity. And whether we think of that as being centered at one half or not, we can. So if this is one half, then okay, we're going negative infinity to infinity. So we're shading the whole number line. How far is it, do you think, from one half to infinity and from one half to negative infinity? If we think of it as having a radius still, what do you think the radius would be? It would be infinity because it's an infinite distance from one half to either endpoint. There's not really endpoints. It goes to infinity. So this is it. There are no endpoints to test when this happens, but the interval of convergence is negative infinity to infinity, radius infinity. My bad, Colin. I didn't see you say that in chat, but yes, that is one. That is infinity. All right. Does everybody follow that? Now, the reason I say that this is easier is because now we don't have to test any endpoints, so there's no more work to do. Um, the reason I say it's easier to get backward is because, okay, we got zero here, which is less than one. That's always true, which is why the interval is everything. If we were to do another problem, so I'm, I'm, we're not gonna do any more examples in here, but if we were to do one where you do the ratio test, and so you do like the limit that we're doing of whatever, AK plus one over AK. And you do, you know, work here. And then you get, in, let's say you get, uh, let's say you get absolute value of X minus five times the limit as K approaches infinity of, whoops. Know what that just was, but all right. Can you guys still see everything? All right. Oh well. Uh, so the limit of three k squared plus seven over, let's say three k plus one. If that happens, then you get infinity as the answer because the biggest thing on top is three k squared. Biggest thing on bottom is three k, and so then this goes to infinity. Well. We want to know when is this less than one. What this tells you is that for the ratio test. For all x, you always get infinity. Well, when is infinity less than one? Never. Never. So instead of always, well, this is never true. OK, so in this case, when we're talking about the center, so this is like 4, sort of. So the center would be 5, pretty clearly from this, right? The center would have been 5. The interval of convergence. And the radius convergence, the thing is that it has to converge at the center. It doesn't have to converge anywhere else, but it has to converge at the center. So the interval convergence is just what we call the singleton five. You put braces around it and you say, okay, it only converges when X is five. So if you draw that on a number line, the interval is that single dot. So what do you think we would describe the radius as? How wide is that? Or how far is it from the center to the endpoint? Go ahead, my bad, I didn't, did not mean to zero. Draw. Zero. So we would say the radius of convergence is zero. And so when this happens, it's ideal because it's easier. You have to think about it and it's a little weirder, but it's easier because there are no endpoints to test. The problem is it's easy to get backward. So as long as you keep this straight, we're good to go. If you get zero, the interval though, the radius is infinity. The interval is negative infinity to infinity. But if you get infinity, the radius is zero. And the interval is just whatever the center is. And so those two cases are easier, but they're easier to get backward. So just be careful with that. But it is easier if these two things happen. So if you get zero, it converges everywhere because that's always true. If you get infinity, it only converges at the center. It converges nowhere else because this is never true. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions so far? Okay, so that is how we do the interval and radius convergence. Um, there is not a web assign up yet, but there will be a web assign 
called Power Series One. Uh, it'll be up later this afternoon. I was working on it right before class and I just didn't have time to finish it. That's why I came in right at uh, 1230 because I was trying to get the thing finished. But I teach right after this. So it'll be late this afternoon that it'll go up. Um, that will be due Monday. You know what? Let's, yeah, well, that'll be due Monday at 11.59 p.m. And then if you want to request an extension, only through Tuesday. So like you can take your, the penalty or whatever for the extension, but only for one day. Um, you guys are not allowed to work on this over Thanksgiving break. So you're off from Wednesday to Sunday, you need to take a break. And I know it'll be hard to not work on power series, but you're gonna have to not for about six days. Okay, so please do not work on this uh, after next Tuesday. So power series one will be due Monday. And then I'm not gonna allow you guys to do extensions after Tuesday. So please don't, please do not work on this over break. Um, 